Hey, thanks for tuning in. I wanted to make a video dedicated to composition. So not focusing on drawing and not focusing on design, but just composition. So assuming you've, you've figured out the drawing aspects, you've figured out how to design characters, etc. But how to arrange them inside of a composition is almost just as, if not more important. And so I wanted to devote a video to that. Um, so I'm going to go through some modern day compositions, mostly book cover illustrations, talk about what makes them work, and show you how you can easily ruin them. Um, because in my opinion, uh, a really good composition is very easy to ruin. It's the opposite of robust. Everything is so calculated, so precisely thought out, that if you mess it up, if you change it, um, it's really going to ruin it. So I'm going to look through, um, I'm going to start with Brahm. Uh, this is a, a book cover that he made to his own art book. And uh, the very first thing, obviously, that, that you're probably picking up on is the use of contrast, the extremes of light and dark. Um, you know, the very first thing you want to do with any composition is guide the eye of the viewer to the focal point. And so in this case, the focal point is her, right? and uh, or at least the skin portions of of the character and secondarily to that perhaps the title although most of the time in the book cover the title is first but since this is an artist uh, doing a cover for his own art book um, it makes sense that he would put the title down at the bottom and make it secondary to the art itself so our, our focal point remains there and it's because of the use of contrast now if i eye drop the dark that's right by where the hair is and the lightest portion which is the skin notice how uh, different those two colors are uh, that one's all the way up to like 90 percent and the dark is close to zero maybe five percent and so the extremes of light and dark are really what's guiding our eye to that part of the composition but that's not everything there are a number of other things that the artist has done here uh, one of those is using vectors which I'll go over in a minute so here I'm showing the contrast between secondary elements so parts that uh, of the composition that your eye would gravitate to looking at after it's looked at the primary focal point and you can see how as we move away from the focal point the contrast between the, the darkest areas and the lightest areas don't diverge very much from each other, maybe 10 percentage points at the most. And then you can go even further down, like for example, the difference in color between the emblem on the shield and the shield itself, and maybe you just have a couple of percentage points there. Now here in red, I'm showing the vectors that I was mentioning earlier. There's a number of lines and curves that are performing a number of different functions to help frame the focal point uh, even further so it's not only encased in uh, a, a darkness of uh, a dark frame but the lines of all the elements surrounding the focal point create this really elegant triangular shape which also helps bring our eye there now there's also a greater shape that encompasses all the focal point and the secondary elements and it's kind of an OG shape there it's like two pyramids one on top of the other and that's sort of the primary uh, overall shape of the composition. Now here what I'm showing is that um, I could easily ruin this composition simply by adding a fourth prong to uh, the, the, the weapon that she's carrying. I could also change the length of the feathers that are coming off of the headdress that she has on and that would distract. Uh, I could change the contrast in any one element and just completely ruin the entire composition. So if I mess with the vectors, if I mess with the colors, if I mess with the contrast, I ruin the composition. And what that shows you is how carefully everything is orchestrated to make it work. Uh, that face down there is a little sort of reward for the viewer who spends time looking at the composition. It's the very last thing you will see because the contrast between the elements is so low, the threshold is so small that your eye is unlikely to find it in, unless you spend a certain amount of time admiring the composition. So that's uh, you know a really great, if you can fit something like that into your composition, then it's like extra bonus points essentially for, for the viewer.
So I'm going to move on to something, uh, another book cover. This is a little older, uh, but a lot of the same principles apply. And there are some new things uh, that are being done here. First of all, uh, the title is first and foremost, the most important thing, which is usually the case for book covers. You want people to see the title first and the illustration second. So that's definitely been um, orchestrated. So that, that's the case. There's a, a lot of contrast, not only in the colors, but the shape of the logo. Um, and then it's integrated into the illustration by having a number of curved uh, vectors and lines that lead the eye from the logo down through the illustration. It's like it takes you on a little journey. And the artists had to pay attention to that. Uh, they even helped with it by um, having the illustration sort of uh, kick a little bit in front of the overlap the, the logo a little bit. There's, I, I would argue, maybe not well done because there's a little bit of a tangency on the lower left corner with one of the towers. But nonetheless, um, it's clearly been arranged so your eye goes from the logo all the way down and you notice those shapes are kind of interspersed with sort of a rhythmic pattern so that it guides your eye uh, in a pleasant way uh, down the illustration with as little bit of monotony as possible. You want to avoid repetition also known as twinning. Uh, for example if one of those ships had simply been copied and pasted or one of the buildings had been copied and pasted and you'd have two things that were the same shape that's called twinning as in twins and uh, that can be a huge visual distraction to the composition so if you're gonna have multiple of a kind like there like was done with the ships vary them in size think about the spacing in such a way so that there's a bit of a rhythm between them and uh, you'll have a you'll create a much more pleasant experience for the viewer Okay, so moving on to something different. Uh, symmetrical compositions are challenging because uh, symmetry can be very boring and very monotonous and ha be a sort of give you that twinning problem that I was mentioning earlier. But notice here that even though this is a symmetrical composition, the positive and negative shapes are anything but symmetrical. And this is really important. Uh, if you're going to do a symmetrical composition, you need to make sure that it is anything but, which I know sounds like uh, an oxymoron, but that's that's really how you what you have to do to make it work. Um, this illustration has some new things that I haven't talked about. Um, one of the things that I like most about this is the full use of color. The whole color palette is encased in the in the male character's face, which is clearly the focal point. And then the secondary colors are used almost monochromatically everywhere else. Um, so we look at the girl that's to the right of him. She's definitely very, uh, very important to the illustration, but it's definitely secondary to him. And uh, it's not done through contrast. Well, some of it's done through contrast. I mean, the color of the cape, of the hood, and the color of his skin is pretty extreme. But she's got some high contrast elements too. And so it's really just the use of color palette that is making him the focal point. Now, of course, vectors, like I mentioned earlier, are important, and those are being used to frame the character as well, and also the integration of the logo, which I kind of highlighted there with the red line. Uh, this, this book cover is doing something else, which is to integrate some of the textural elements that are found in the illustration into the logo. And this is especially important to do if you have a very gritty and textured illustration like this one. Uh, because otherwise the logo feels a little bit too apart or from like a different universe from the illustration and so uh, that's something that the layout artist and the logo artist has to take into consideration it's not always something that the illustrator has control over now clearly here the logo is the first and foremost thing we want to look at but right beside it is that hammer both of these things have a lot of contrast but they also have proximity to each other and so it's pretty much a sure thing that your eye is going to go to that logo and even if it doesn't it goes to the hammer it's going to the logo right right after that uh, once your eye is up there there's a number of vectors guiding your eyes down through the character and you can take a couple paths you can go from the cape all the way around to the mountains which guides you through the clouds and then there's some birds there which are redirecting your eyes down through the crowd in the background and back up the cape 
And that's essentially the fundamental circulation. And what I like about this circulation that's done here is how it's very three-dimensional. You start at the foreground, but then you work your way back into space, looping back around the hammer and then back to the foreground. And that's really cool. I like that. Now, uh, there's a number of rewards here if you choose to spend time with the illustration as a viewer and uh, you know, scattered on the foreground and the bottom, there's things that you can discover. So this illustration is a classic example of all the things I've been talking about. Use of color palette variation, uh, brightness and contrast, vectors, you know, if I were to change any of those things, it would ruin the composition. So everything is carefully calibrated, brightness and contrast, uh, lights and shadows, warms and cools, uh, framing devices and vectors, the sword that is in his hand, and the jewels that are sticking out of the ground, everything's pointing to the focal point. Okay, I want to wrap up with this illustration, which is showing some really good use of positive and negative shapes. And this is something else that you really want to try to figure out when you're creating your composition. The positive and negative shapes are essentially the spaces, uh, the shapes formed by the spaces between the objects, either in the foreground or in the background. Whenever there's sort of a, a, a border of some kind, you can generate what's called a negative space. And what you want to pay attention to here is how these positive and negative spaces or shapes have a sort of language to them. Um, they're consistent. And when I look at um, all of these in isolation of each other, they all kind of mirror the same style, the same language. I, I kind of equate it to when you're designing a font and you're creating like the profile of something like a Times New Roman font the letter I and the letter T have those serifs, right? And the serifs are consistent. Well, when you're designing a composition, your positive and negative shapes are kind of like those serifs. And every artist, uh, if you study individual artists and, and see how they differ one from the other, you'll find that the, the language of their line, the language of their positive and negative shapes, uh, there's sort of a consistency there. And that's kind of what helps you identify one artist from another. Now, there's positive and negative shapes uh, outside of the objects, but also inside of the objects, like I was showing there with the, the chest, the breastplate, or the chest details on the dragon. Um, now, here's a typical book cover illustration, and I'm featuring it because it actually has um, a lot of problems and things that it didn't uh, accomplish. It, it has some decent layout and placement, but there are some brightness and contrast issues and distribution of detail that is not really working. So look at it, analyze it, and if you can figure out what's not working about it, leave it in the comments and we'll see how you did with uh, this lecture. Thanks for watching, guys.